Welcome, I'm Michael Hart. Thanks very much for joining me today. The title of this module is The Path from Suffering to Success, Truly Effective Advocacy for Your Child with Learning Issues. This course is about the emotional preparation parents need to effectively advocate for their child with learning differences. You know, I've worked with thousands of families over my career, and I've developed a method to reduce the confusion and frustration that parents, and certainly their kids, often feel when they're advocating for the child's instructional needs. Now, there are many websites that will teach you about your rights and the law. In fact, I strongly urge you to take a look at those as well. In a little bit later, I'm going to talk about a bibliography of resources that I compiled for you that directly list those support organizations that you need to take a look at. My approach, specifically, helps give you the stamina and courage to help your child achieve educational success. So today we're going to talk about a five-part approach to help parents and caregivers protect their families' hearts and souls while creatively approaching the task of caring for their child's needs. Now, as you all know, or you wouldn't be here, that discovery that your child has a learning problem can be very confusing, frustrating, and clearly often overwhelming. Many of us, even, even bright, high-functioning people, really struggle with figuring out what to do. And of course, our first reaction oftentimes is to reach out to the school for help and support. For a myriad of reasons, we may find out that teachers and their colleagues are not properly supported and are ill-prepared to provide all the kinds of help that we need. So in addition to the lack of training and support for the teachers, we also have an educational system that is often messy and slow moving. In the meantime, our kids suffer needlessly, sometimes for years. That's got to change, but that's going to take time. Now recently, while meeting with a group of parents, I was struck again by the pain and agony we feel when we assume that our kids' school officials have the support and the know-how or the resources to adequately take care of our students' special learning needs. And then we find out that they don't. I've been experiencing this pain and agony since I started practicing 25 years ago. It's really truly needless suffering, and we've got to change this. But to be clear, I am a huge advocate for teachers. The vast majority of educators are seriously committed to their profession, they want to do their best. But a lack of proper educational opportunities, inadequate professional development, and limited resources frequently stand in the way of their ability to function effectively. Now let me just give you the context. Of course, probably all of you know by now that the research states somewhere between 10 and 20 percent of our kids, by virtue of how their brain is wired, struggle to some degree with dyslexia. They struggle with the development of their literacy skills. And I leave that large gap in there because that shouldn't be the point of argument. The point is this, that is a lot of kids. That is millions of kids all over the world who struggle to some degree by virtue of how their brain is wired with the development of their reading, writing, and spelling skills. Now against that backdrop, Take a look at this 2014 study by the National Council on Teacher Quality that reports that three out of four elementary teacher preparation programs in the United States still are not properly training teachers to work with struggling readers, or any readers for that matter. And when you get to the secondary school level, they don't even measure reading and written language curricula because they're focused on content development, correct? So you have this huge gaping hole where a very large number of our kids need proper support by virtue of how their brain is wired, but the teachers aren't getting the support they need in their training and in their professional development to know what to do when they see these kids. Now we also know that the majority of our students who struggle with learning struggle due to issues with language-based processing. So first and foremost, how can you expect a teacher or educational team to help your child in this area 
when they aren't given the education, training, and experience to do so? The short answer is they can't. Now, we need to change that reality, and some good things are happening these days, particularly in the States, but it's going to take decades. That's the truth. It's going to take a very, very long time to move this ship around. So I've come to realize that the path from suffering to success is found by changing our assumptions, expanding our focus, and taking better care of our heart and soul right now. We can't wait. We cannot wait. Now, over the course of 25 years of working with kids and their families, I've created and been able to refine this five-part program where parents and guardians have to think much more creatively about their kids who have learning challenges, starting at the very beginning of awareness of the problem. Now, the core belief behind my program can be pretty obvious, but also rather provocative and nerve-wracking for the child's caregivers at first, because I really directly challenge the assumption that experts lie outside the family. And by that, I mean that, of course, there are experts who are going to be absolutely critical to your child's success that you have been able to engage over the course of the years that the child's in school. But when it really comes down to it, in a nutshell, parents or primary caregivers are always going to be the most powerful and effective advocate for their child. No one not your child's teacher, not their tutor, guidance counselor, consultant, principal, therapist, will be more effective than you. And I completely understand. You may not feel that way in the beginning, but you can get there. Because it's important to remember, this is a multi-year issue. Dyslexia does not go away. So it's really a triathlon, not a sprint. But you will get there, and so will your child. Now, as I implied. This is not to say that there's not a role for educational consultants and tutors and so forth. We can be super helpful at certain points in the child's educational career. But the truth is, in the long run, we often come and go. Over the years, you know, things change, things happen, and the one core group that remains constant are the parents of this child. So we are really effective, myself as a psychologist or an educational consultant, we're really effective serving as anchors or guides, but we are most effective when we guide your self-directed education. So it's the old teach man to fish and eat forever model. So let's get into this five steps. And first one I want to talk about is Fully accept and embrace the role as your child's advocate. Now, what, what do I mean by that? My goodness, complete emotional acceptance that you're able and you can be effective. So here's the deal. This is not meant to offend you at all. Many of us feel overwhelmed by the process of advocating for our kid when we think we don't know a thing about their challenges. You know, we don't know about neuroscience. We don't know about our rights. We don't know about IEPs yet. But the point of it is that you will. And you've got to remember that when we offer up our children to the educational bureaucracy, months and months or even years can go by before you get a proper remediation plan in place. So you've got to learn to trust yourself. Emotionally accept that you are not only able to take on the role, but you can be effective. And it creates a mindset for you where you'll feel much more rapidly comfortable with looking at all your options, both school, in school, and out and making more informed decisions. Now, I, I'm fully aware of what it's like to walk into that first IEP meeting and you probably don't have a consultant with you and there's six or eight people around the room and they're really intensely invested in not giving you what you should have by law. And I remember what it's like to go over these 20-page evaluations that are full of all kinds of terminology that looks you know, completely foreign and uh, difficult to understand and all these test scores and what do all these test scores mean, all of that. But you have to remember that in the beginning, 
you fully accept and embrace your role of your child's advocate with full knowledge that this is a learning process that will take time. So are things you can do in the beginning to help mitigate that sense of being overwhelmed. And the first thing, most importantly, on an emotional level, just say to yourself, you know what, I can do this. I'm going to be able to do this. It's not going to happen overnight. And that's key because you know early intervention is the most important thing and you cannot take a let's wait and see approach because you're going to hear that a lot. So that's the there's an emotion component to this. Now, step two is really kind of very closely tied with step one, right? Educate yourself relentlessly. And again, that underlying emotional belief in yourself. Retain the faith that you will prevail in the end, regardless of the difficulties. Now, one of the wonderful aspects of the digital revolution has obviously been our ability to access information that was previously locked up far and away from lay people. There are mountains of content out there that you will find helpful in both understanding what you're dealing with as well as what to do about it. Initially, you know, it takes time, but you'll grow your database and knowledge quickly. It's not rocket science. Even understanding the underlying neurobiology is totally doable. Just slow down and you'll learn the specific terminology. Now, as I mentioned at the very beginning, one key issue will be your awareness of the rights in negotiating the services within the school district. Know them well. So one of the first steps I'm going to suggest to you is that you're going to go to the National Center for Learning Disabilities website, NCLD, and I know many of you listening have probably already done this. They do an excellent job of providing a ton of information about what your rights are, what the rules are, how to find what you need, and so forth. The second thing you want to do is, if you haven't already, you immediately engage with your decoding dyslexia chapter in your state. I'm pretty sure we now have covered all 50 states, and it is a wealth. It, it, there's a couple things. It's a wealth of information, because these are highly motivated and oftentimes highly experienced parents. The same thing if you're in Australia, you just use Defy Dyslexia. It's the same thing. It's a wonderful organization of caring people who are intensely focused on taking care of the kids. Now, I'm going to go through the bibliography in a minute, but I want to make a couple more points. Over time, your need for certain types of information will change. In other words, for instance, the demands of middle school are different than the demands of high school and college, or the demands of you know elementary school are different than middle school. The issue is how your child's or your loved one's brain is wired will likely not change, but how they use their brains to meet the environmental challenges will shift over time. And information regarding how to manage those transitions is available to you now. So. With this set of slides that I sent you, I've also sent a bibliography of resources regarding dyslexia. And I want to stop here and just ask you, if you've downloaded it or if you have it available, let's take a look at it so I can walk you through this. Now, first thing I start with are support organizations. And I, of course, already mentioned the National Center for Learning Disabilities. But there are many, many other sites, and this is just a a compendium of some of the most important sites that I have been able to find. Learning Ally, with whom I do a lot of work, is highly recommended too, not just for their audiobooks, but they also provide a lot of services that are very supportive of parents who are becoming more fierce advocate for their kids. And then there are certainly many, many other great sites. I mentioned Decoding Dyslexia, the Yale Center for Dyslexia and Creativity. All of these sites are just wonderful, wonderful fonts of really rich troves of information. Now, for your own edification, I also noted a couple of the top online tutor training groups. And I think all of you by now would know that Orton-Gillingham approach is the gold standard for 
addressing phonological awareness issues. We need to be a little bit more broader based when we talk about uh, rapid automatic naming, uh, but that's uh, a discussion for another module. Now, with regard to books, if you're new in this process, if you haven't already, the f one of the first things you need to do is immediately get a copy of Sally Shaywitz's Overcoming Dyslexia. It has become a core book for every parent who has dealt with or struggled with this issue. It, and it's a beautifully written book with a ton of information and it's absolutely necessary that it's on everybody's bookshelf. And of course you can, if finances are an issue, you just get a used copy on Amazon or something like that. I also highly recommend another book that's not on here. It's called Proust and the Squid by Marianne Wolf. It's about the story and the science of the reading brain. That's a little bit more challenging in terms of a quick read, but it's also very, very well written and it's very powerful information. So there are other books that I recommend. There are certainly films that have really been very helpful in terms of creating a greater consciousness about dyslexia in the last few years. I also left some links for you here with regard to you know, the introduction to dyslexia. I'm going to point out a couple of them. One is the, you heard me mention, rapid automatized naming. That's a very, very important component that we need to look at every time we screen or test for dyslexia with our kids. It's written by Marianne Wolf and Elizabeth Norton. Highly, highly recommended that you uh, capture this link and read that document when you have time. Also, Sally Shaywitz's article about the education of the ch from childhood to the young adulthood is very good. All of these, quite frankly, are, are really, really great resources. And understand that you have to take them a piece at a time. This is going to be something that you're going to develop over the years. Now, I want to mention specifically the many strands that are woven into skilled reading. It's the last article that I talk about. It is a very, very rich, very well-organized compendium of information about students and their literacy development. And I highly recommend that you have that available to you as a resource that you will go back to time and time again. Remember, this is a process. This is a triathlon. This is not something where you just need to become an expert overnight. Just give yourself the emotional support that you need to realize that you're going to be able to get your arms around this. Now, there's a couple of other highly re recommended resources for teachers and parents. One called Humans Not Robots. I thought it was very rich and just an exhaustive site, quite frankly. Uh, there's uh, some specific sites for understanding bright kids with dyslexia, supporting resilience in children with dyslexia, a little bit about multisensory intervention programs and approaches, for instance, Wharton Gillingham. There are some links here for accommodations for dyslexic students, uh, specifically with regard to technology integration, mind mapping tools, also strategies for communicating with parents. And because a large chunk of our kids also struggle with attention and concentration difficulties, I've included some information about ADHD as well. Okay, so that's a, I hope, hope you had that in front of you, but if not, of course you own this now, so you can listen to it any time, but I would really strongly urge you to, as, as you need to, as you can, just start working your way through that, and you'll find that you will be armed with a tremendous amount of information. Now, let's talk about part three. And I make this uh, point knowing full well that this is a bit challenging all, as well. Evaluate all your options for supporting your child, both in your community and within your school district. Now, the cliche, I use this cliche because I think it's true, it takes a village to raise a child. In most cases, you will find that you will need community and home-based resources above and beyond what the school is offering for remediation and skill building. Now this may take the form of private school placement, extra tutoring, special classes, and by that I mean both classes to help with the dyslexia as well as classes that give your child pleasure. And fortunately, 
educational technology has become one of the most powerful tools for remediation, training, and education. I'm, I'm a strong believer that the software and applications available today are completely transforming how we work with our children, especially so for people with dyslexia. That's why I call it a specific revolution, because obviously educational technology is going through a revolution, but we as parents and supporters of dyslexic kids find that specifically to us it's been even more important. Let me step back a little bit and talk about what's underlying this idea or this concept of expanding your village when I'm specifically talking about our kids that have learning issues. I'm going to give you an example in a few minutes, but I think I want to talk about the main drivers first. And this is sometimes where when you're under a lot of stress and you're overwhelmed and you're full of tension, you kind of miss that at the most basic level, what you know, of course, to be true in your life every day. And that is that the main driver as a parent is to guide the growth of your child so they're happy and healthy. Of course you know that. That's what every parent wants for their child every single day. But if we get so caught up with demanding that the school provide everything that the child needs, and that ends up being a lengthy battle, then going to school is going to traumatize the kids. You know, I know you've seen this. You know, I talk about it, and I'll talk about it a little bit later, you know, seven hours a day, five days a week, nine months out of the year, our kids are in an environment that is basically pounding on them. So the point here is that, of course, as a parent, you know that you want to guide the growth of their lives so that they're happy and healthy and didn't expect to have this situation where your children are struggling so much in school. Sometimes just kind of stepping back and remembering that often helps us expand our thinking about how we're going to create that environment where our child feels happy and safe. And you'll hear me talk a lot about how certain kids that have pretty significant dyslexia or other learning issues, school is never going to be a place where they can shine. Now, we're always going to work towards finding little places where they can really show their strengths and really kind of, like I said, shine. But for the most part, we've got to look beyond the school setting and say, okay, what really gives my child great joy and how can I give that to them now to balance out things as they go through this very difficult time in their lives in the educational system? So I want to, as an example, talk to you about a mom that I was working with a few months ago, and she had a real dilemma, and I think this will resonate with a lot of you. She lived in a rural area, so there weren't a lot of resources for kids that had learning problems within the community, per se. The school also didn't have a lot of resources, but the child had a pretty significant profile of dyslexia. And he'd been struggling for years, and mom had been working so hard not only to demand that the school be accountable, but she went so far as to doing everything she could to support the teacher's efforts to learn more, figure out how to take better care of her son in the classroom. But as the years went by, it just became increasingly more frustrating and increasingly more traumatizing for the child to the point where he was literally begging her to not let him go back to school anymore at all. So she was really faced with this dilemma, and, it, and this wasn't my idea, but she had created this wonderful plan, and she was asking me whether I thought this was something that would make sense for her in her situation, and it was this. Mom is a really high-functioning person, and so she really knew how to look out into the community and find whatever resources might be available to her. She fully and completely understood that um, she needed to find a counterbalance to her child's struggles with reading and uh, written language and spelling. So what she did was this. 
she decided that she was going to connect with homeschooling people in her community for a couple of reasons. One, she had done it before, but the problem was that she had a difficult time moving from the mom-child relationship to the teacher-child relationship, and that was really kind of tough on her and tough on the kids, so it wasn't optimum. But what she was able to realize is that recently there has been an explosion of homeschooling support and organizations specifically for kids who have learning differences. So she was able to reach out to some people to find out what kind of curriculum were necessary was necessary for her to have for her son and so that she met legal requirements in the state. But she also did this incredibly brilliant thing, and this is partly luck. She found a teacher that her son really, really liked who taught language arts, and she was retiring, and she had Orton-Gillingham training. And now that she's retired, she's still looking for things to do. So she kind of served as the cornerstone for this woman to uh, to get the right reading instruction for her son while he was in this kind of derivative homeschool environment. So she was able to get some resources online with regard to other curriculum. She was able to use the language arts teacher uh, on a pretty much Monday through Friday basis every single day. But really the most beautiful stroke was that, come to find out that her son loves hunting and camping. And they're in a rural area, so it's you know very deeply ingrained in their community. And it ends up that there's a shooting range not far from their home. And the boy had shown some great ability in terms of his marksmanship and the people that own the place and the people that work there really really cared about this young man. So mom went to them and explained the situation. So they quote unquote made a an internship for him, essentially, where he could go and learn more about gun safety, learn more about firing, and then be able to use that on his hunting and his camping trips. And they set it up so that he could be there and help clean up or help around the facility in some ways. But it allowed him to be in a place that gave him great joy. And it was really fascinating. She told me the story about how, I mean, the poor little guy struggled. He's, you know, sixth, seventh grade by now, I think. He struggled tremendously reading anything in school. But he could tell you the name of every single part of his gun and how to take it apart, how to put it back together, how to keep it clean. He knew gun safety rules. Uh, it, it was just like an area where he found that just helped him blossom. So mom is, that story of that family is the perfect example of a mom who was really able to expand her village. She was able to get her husband more involved and her extended family members, and she just was able to find resources that were congruent with what her son's needs were so that he could be happy and healthy. Now, I wanted it to serve as an example that you could think about in your own circumstances. Now, another thing that happens a lot, I know, is the families that I work with, they have very limited resources. So I'm going to circle back to a couple of things that I've said before, and that is a part of expanding your village, and that is definitely being involved in your Decoding Dyslexia Facebook groups. You'll find that, number one, you're not alone, and number two, there's a great deal of conversation, community building, where you know a mom with limited resources may be able to borrow some kind of product or, or services that um, she needs specifically for her child at that point in time. There's a lot of discussion about the kinds of free technology that's available out there. A lot of chance to just get in the community and find out who's doing what and then making a decision about whether that fits for your, your child and your family. Also with limited resources, I would urge you to think about like mom did with the young child that loves to hunt, where can you perhaps draw on community resources, perhaps the, you know, the Boy Scouts or sports teams or somewhere where they have somewhere in their lives where they can really shine. I have another example on my website, Emily West, the runner-up of the America's Got Talent television show, 
and she was gracious enough to do a interview with me and she was very she is very dyslexic and she told the story about how her parents created an environment for her that really mitigated the pain of being in school and really supported this extraordinary talent that she has and that's available on my site for no cost I mean, it's a kind of a really a wonderful heartwarming uh, story I think is really really great so Step three, expand your village. Always keep in mind, of course, you know this as a parent, it's all about giving your child a safe and happy environment in which to grow. And if school is going to be a very traumatizing place for them, let that be a way to really kind of press you to expand your thinking about how we're going to take care of this child in a way that may be very different than what we traditionally think of. Because sometimes what happens is we get so intensely focused on demanding that the schools provide what your child needs that we get out of balance. And we forget that even if we win a big, huge battle in court, that oftentimes the schools, by virtue of the lack of the support that they have, aren't going to be able to provide your child what they need anyway. And as I mentioned earlier in this presentation, that's going to change. But frankly, that's the way it is now. And so we have to we have to be thoughtful about that and figure out ways to get around that. Okay, so now let's move on to the next one. Okay, step four in my five part plan is quite a challenge, as is step five, but I think it's something that needs to be spoken about openly. Let me just start by talking about the word fiercely. I wanted to do, make sure that um, that wasn't misunderstood. True fierceness is really more about being fearless. So I talk about learning to become an enlightened warrior, which really means not doing battle, not acting like a bull in a china shop, but actually transcending above that and learning to, in the in the face of this incredible challenge, remain calm, ready, fearless, and just never willing to give up. So I've, I've got this quote here, you know, the sacred warrior conquers the world not through violence or aggression, but through gentleness, courage, and self-knowledge. The warrior discovers the basis, basic goodness of human life and radiates that goodness out into the world for the peace and sanity of others. And I understand that when you are very concerned about your child's well-being, this is a extraordinary challenge emotionally. When you're living and you're watching your child suffer, uh, it's just normal and uh, natural to want to be protective. And oftentimes that protectiveness ends up being this other kind of a warrior where you're you know, just laying waste to everybody around you. Now, hopefully what I'm trying to do with the step four is help you understand that if we work on understanding that our best strategy, help our child have a happy and safe environment, then we have to do the work on our own to make sure that we don't get caught up in a singular focus that creates more tension and creates more problems or suffering for both you and your child and your family than not. So what I'm suggesting here is that by learning to become an enlightened warrior, it helps with reducing the tendency to get caught up in a singular focus. And oftentimes that singular focus is demanding that the school do what they can't. Now, I know that it makes sense and it's appropriate to continue to work with the school in ways that helps them improve the way they take care of our kids. And at the same time, we know that that's a long process and however frustrating and however upsetting, it just has to serve as an example and a reminder to us that we're going to get what we can but that shouldn't preclude us from building out that village that we're talking about in step three. Because that is really going to reflect what you really want 
which is your child to feel happy and safe. So I know that this is a lifelong process. You know, this is this is an extraordinary difficult thing for any of us to do. And yet at the same time, we have to aspire to this level of fearlessness in order to be the best advocate, the most effective advocate for our kids. And all I really want to do is serve as a reminder, because I know, of course, you know this. This is a part of who you are as, a, as an adult. But every once in a while, it's helpful to re be reminded that we need to make sure that we are acting in the most effective way to create that environment that we want for all of our kids. So step four is to learn how to become an enlightened warrior. So the question then becomes, okay, fine, I'm supposed to become an enlightened warrior. How do I do that? And how do I become calmer and more ready and more fearless? And, of course, you're never going to give up anyway. And that's going to be by taking care of your heart and soul. That's the process. That is what you need to do to advocate more fiercely. Now, I've recently done a uh, free module that's entitled uh, 10 Ways to Take Care of Your Heart and Soul. That's available on my website. You can get that anytime you'd like. But I thought I would, for specifically for this course, I wanted to talk about some of the top ways in which you can take care of your heart and soul. That leads directly into our overall goal here, which is, of course, to take care of our kid and more effectively advocate for their needs. So, as I mentioned before, you know, for our kids who have learning issues, seven hours a day, five days a week, nine months out of the year, they're in an environment where, at the very best, they're being told there's something wrong with them. At the very worst, they're being told that they're failures. And so it behooves us to make sure that we're doing everything to take care of ourselves so that we have the emotional wherewithal to take care of our kids and make sure that we're providing them with that safe and happy environment as much as possible. Now, taking care of our kids with learning differences, as you know, is tough. Usually when they talk about resilience, they talk about resilience in terms of a person kind of rebounding from a single event or a couple of events maybe. In our kids' case, the resilience has to come from a place of great strength because this is an ongoing issue that they have to deal with year in and year out. And that can be incredibly, as you know, I mean, you're living it, that can be incredibly difficult. And there's a real potential for you to forget to replenish your spirit on a regular basis and remember how incredibly important that is. It's absolutely key because it gives you the strength to conduct yourself the way you want to conduct yourself with an integrity and effectiveness. So let's talk about a few ways that you got to remember to take care of your heart and soul that's going to really be helpful to you in this five-step plan. First one I want to talk about is remember to predict that there are going to be times where you're going to get knocked off balance. And it's not a reflection of who you are as a person. It's just a reflection of the way life goes. And that's a very, very important distinction. Getting knocked off balance happens to all of us. And I mean, you know, getting knocked off balance emotionally or being blindsided emotionally, whatever form it takes for you. But that is not a function of who you are as a person. That's a function of life just being life. So if we predict that sometimes we're going to get knocked off balance, it gives us an opportunity to step back and reset and be a little bit more focused and clear about getting back in step. Does that make sense? And one of the ways you do that is by being really clear about how to make use of your support system. So the second thing you do is being able to reach out to people 
effectively when you get jangled. There's always going to be, it, it might be your spouse, it might be your best friends, it might be your dog, but reaching out to your support system when you're feeling jangled. So it doesn't have to be this lengthy process. It doesn't have to be a huge event. It just may be something as simple as if you had a really bad day and your husband comes home or your spouse comes home and, you know, it's just a quick two-minute conversation. Maybe you've got a signal that you use or whether it's just, you know, a, getting a sense for recognition that you had a rough day and you're in the process of, of kidding yourself back into step. For some people, it really, it might just be getting onto the Decoding Dyslexia Facebook pages. I see that every day where parents understand that the other parents on the site appreciate and understand what they're going through. And sometimes it just helps to say, boy, oh boy, this is what happened to me today. And it gives you an opportunity to make sure, again, that you don't feel like you're alone and that there are people who understand you. I can't emphasize that enough because there are going to be really rough days and we want to make sure that you've got a system in place to give you the nurturance and give you the kind of breathing room that you need in order to get back on track. Now, specifically when I talk about breathing, you'll probably in other places hear me talk about finding those breath moments during your day. And I talk about that in terms of the fact that these days our lives are so extraordinarily hectic from the minute we get up until the minute we go to bed. And I challenge you to find breath moments where there is one minute or 90 seconds where you're by yourself and you can stop and just breathe and take in what's going on around you and give yourself a chance to be calm. And the example that I use a lot is uh, when I go to the store and I go by myself, what I do is I drive into the parking garage or the parking lot and I park, and instead of jumping out right that moment, I mean, we're talking about 60 to 90 seconds here. I stop, I sit, and I breathe. And I just try to become focused on where I'm at right now and being and being mindful and reminding myself that you know we have the strength to get through this we're going to find a way to take good care of our kid we're going to be able to manage whatever it is that our child grows up healthy and happy but it sounds trivial but actually it can be very powerful you know it might be before everybody gets up in the morning if you're an early riser it might be after everybody goes to bed if you're a, a so you stay up late. Whatever it is, I challenge you to find just a couple of those times per day. Take a breath. Be mindful. And just let yourself know that ultimately things are going to be okay. And allow yourself just to take that moment to reset just a bit. Now, very closely tied to that is the next suggestion I have, which is, and this is, again, this is a doozy, be gentle with yourself. When we have a child with special learning issues, we can, in certain cases, do the woulda, coulda, shoulda thing. You know, if I had only done this, if I had only done that, if I hadn't made this mistake, that doesn't take us where we need to go. And I understand it's a common human foible and we all get caught up in doing that but it, this is an opportunity and it's a way to take care of your heart and soul to be more gentle with yourself and know that we all make mistakes and we've got to let those go and move on somebody once said that anybody who says they're an expert at parenting never had kids and that's the truth we're going to make mistakes every single day and what's important about that is that we're going to learn from them, but at the same time, we're going to be gentle with ourselves and appreciate that, you know, this is a, the most difficult task in the world is to raise a child so they're happy and healthy. So we have to be gentle with ourselves because that replenishes our spirit and gives us a chance to take care of our kids' needs. And finally, I'm going to finish with what I think is probably 
the, the secret sauce for not only getting through the advocacy of taking care of a child with learning issues, but also any kind of long-term relationship, like including marriage. And that is the ability to use humor when things are going tough. Use humor, humor, humor. It's not humor in the way that avoids or denies the situation. It's that humor that accepts the situation. And it's just we understand it's part of the ludic ludicrousness of life, quite frankly. And that we use that to lighten our spirits, to lighten our load, to try to get a perspective that will help us understand and get back to that space where this too shall pass. So again, it's really critical to remember that we're not talking about humor that denies the situation. We're talking about humor that embraces the situation. And that gives us power. Because if we don't acknowledge the situation, then the situation defines us. If we acknowledge the situation, we acknowledge that we have a child that needs extra care or extra help or has learning issues, then it opens up a whole new avenue for us to be able to think about how we're going to do best in terms of our advocacy and raising this child. Remember, if you deny the issue, then it owns you. If you don't deny the issue and lean in, then you own the issue. And that opens up possibilities for you that you didn't have before. I hope you like this picture. I thought it was really cute. So there we have it. Just to quickly review the five steps for truly effective uh, advocacy for your child learning issues is one, fully, fully embrace the role as your child's advocate and trust yourself. Trust that you're capable of doing this. Educate yourself relentlessly. Really think about building that village and how you can, I hate to use the word think out of the box, but how you can use what you know to create an environment that is going to help your child thrive. And then you want to advocate fiercely along the way. And by that, I do not mean like a bull in a china shop. Be calm, be ready, be fearless, and never give up. And again, trust yourself. And then finally, take care of your heart and soul. In this day and age, it's just so incredibly easy for us to lose sight of that. So this is really, of course you know that. And of course I'm just giving you a reminder but it's a reminder that we all need because we're all going 100 miles an hour. And we need to slow down and just give ourselves the nurturance we need to take the best care of our kids. Now, before you go, I'm going to take a minute to review these resources that I've given you in the back of the deck. I went to the International Dyslexia Association site and I found the link to the dyslexia basics and the discussion about incidence rates. That's really kind of for you, something for you to have in your library as a kind of a base foundational thing to take a look at. It also helps you develop the language when you want to describe the basics of dyslexia to another person. I mean, it's pretty well written. I've also included three links here from the NCTU teacher prep review. Now again, remember this goes. Uh, this uh, re prep review occurs every year. It's updated every year. So I gave you the link to the entire report that they provided earlier this year, 2015. And then I broke out the data specifically about elementary teacher prep programs and a discussion about secondary teacher prep. Now this illustrates the chasm we have, right? between what we know in the research about the number of kids whose brains are wired in a way that impacts their literacy skills versus the kind of preparation that teachers are being provided uh, in order for them to be properly prepared to take care of our kids who have these wiring issues. 
and I think it's something to look at every year because I think we're beginning to see some progress, and again, with the caveat that it'll take quite a long time. Now, during the second step, I talked about the bibliography of resources that uh, I created. By no means is it exhaustive, but I think that it's my top hits, so to speak. There's a lot of really, really good uh, links in there that I think you will find helpful. And then, of course, I mentioned a few minutes ago, I've got a module in and of itself that goes into a deeper discussion about the 10 ways to take care of your heart and soul. So I hope you find all this very, very helpful. As always, I want to make sure that you understand that I am wide open to having you contact me with questions and comments. I want to continue to grow my community, and I want to make sure the best way to do that, of course, is to make sure that I'm giving you what you need. So if you're not getting what you need, you need to let me know. If you are getting what you need, you need to let me know. Because I want to be of service to you the best way I can. And it will be a great gift to me if you just let me know. So, again, thank you for listening. And I look forward to connecting with you again in the very near future.